Thank you everyone for joining us. We have the pleasure of uh, hearing from Dr. Edwin Cruz Rivera and uh, looking at what work he's doing. It's, it must, it's, it, it will be interesting to see a, a different side of what goes on. He got a supplement in the RCMI looking at uh, climate change. So we're excited about that and we look forward to working together and hearing about what you're doing. So Dr. Cruz Rivera, please. All right. So like Valerie mentioned, uh, this is gonna be a very different talk for one thing, because I know that a lot of the people that attend the RCMI talks are um, heavily into biomedical, especially molecular. Um, they tend to present a lot of data. Uh, this is not that talk. This is a talk about general patterns. And in order to put my, my work in perspective, it is going to focus a lot on the history of the problem and where I'm going with it. Um, so think about it as uh, twice the hypothesis, have the data, none of the guilt. If you look at the at this picture here, this is a picture from a place called Mandal Bay in the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas. And it looks very much like what we have come to expect in the summertime, occasionally in the past decade. The work that I am going to be focusing on has been uh, part of a larger effort that started a few years back, trying to understand a new phenomenon, an emerging environmental issue that we're having in the Caribbean. And my base of operations has been the Virgin Islands, especially the island of St. Thomas, where I used to be before coming to Morgan State. And I still continue using that as my model system. Now, back in 2011, the news started showing pictures that look like this. These are different environments in the Caribbean, the four different islands, and if these are bays or embayments on the coastline. The brown thing that you see here, all that brown stuff, is actually an accumulation of macroalgae. It's, it's a brown algae that floats around called sargassum. And it has been a cause of panic for many of these economies, particularly for small islands that depend primarily on tourism and fisheries, artisanal fisheries, or both. And a lot of the news that have come out of from those times and still last to the present begin with lines like that. It's an invasion. And they talk about the water turning reddish brown and the air being uh, foul to, to breathe in and smelling of rotten eggs. And we'll get to that towards the end. The fact is that this is a widespread problem and it has led to the de to declarations of natural disasters, as well as um, requests for supplements from different governments around, uh, from Britain, from the Dutch government and from the US government to try to help these islands work towards mitigation efforts for these now known, uh, these events now known as golden tides. So, when you think about the Caribbean, you should the worst thing that you should be worried about right now is not zombies, but it's rather sargassum. And it has been for a few years now. What I'm trying to do with this talk is to take a little bit of an unorthodox view and tell you what we know, what we think we know, and we, what we are hoping to know in the, in the near future. The term golden tides comes from a, uh, a paper in 2013 by Victor Smetasek and uh, his, uh, his colleague Zingon. And it refers to these accumulations of these floating algae. The algae is called sargassum and it's basically two species, three growth forms of two different species. Now there are over 200 species of sargassum. Most of them grow by a, attached to the bottom. But these two species have evolved a completely pelagic floating lifestyle. And in fact, they were first observed, or at least they were first documented by Columbus when he was coming to the Americas, when he crossed to what is known now as the Sargasso Sea. In ecological terms, these masses of seaweed are what we call aloctonous organic matter. In other words, this is carbon that has been imported into the shoreline that did not form 
or did not grow in that shoreline. And because of that, it requires a different perspective when you're trying to manage this issue. Because when you're talking about things like harmful algal blooms, those are usually driven by what's happening on the shore that is being affected by them. So nutrient runoff from the coastline where these blooms occur usually is the first place that we try to put our management strategies into reducing these algal biomass. But these are imported. They come from somewhere else. And in fact, the, the origins of these masses may be multiple. In, in some of the old models, what we knew is that sargassum was mostly in the North Atlantic, around the North Atlantic gyre. And it was understood that there was part of that because of this loose, um, loose connection of different surface currents would sort of pinch off little rafts of sargassum and those would drift southward go between the islands of the Antilles, where they would join a westward flow that would eventually take them for a little while to the Gulf of Mexico, where they would spend some residence time. And these floating algal mats will eventually, for the most part, exit through the, the Cape of, uh, to the Horn of Florida, about down the Florida Keys, and rejoin the Sargasso Sea. And this was known as the Sargassum Loop. What we discovered over the years using particularly remote sensing is that the story is not that simple. There is actually three growth zones that are interconnected by this loose system of currents. One is the Sargasso Sea, but there's actually an actively growing zone inside the Gulf of Mexico. And this newer feature that was discovered less than a decade ago called the North Equatorial Recirculating Region. As you can see, this one extends or may extend depending on the time of the year from the northern coast, northeastern coast of Brazil, all the way to the western coast of Africa. So what we understand now is that these sargassum mats may come either from the north or the south, depending on where you are. And they connect, so they form a sort of loose, really large scale algal bloom that we know now as of uh, 2018, as the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. This is from a paper by Wang and colleagues that was published in 2019, looking at remote sensing tools. And what they were able to show is that at the peak of its growth zone, this bloom can extend for almost 9,000 kilometers, carrying over 20 million metric tons of sargassum biomass, connecting the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the coast of Africa. And the models tend to predict, if you look at the graph up on top, you see that over the years, this is sargassum biomass here, you see that these peaks keep getting bigger, suggesting that there is an intensification going on over the decade. So we may be looking at a new Caribbean. Something has changed in the Caribbean, and that's part of what brings me to this talk. Now, these golden tides have a number of effects, but for the first, I would say, five years of the detection of this phenomena, we, as me, I mean, we scientists tended to operate as basically we knew a lot about these. Uh, some of the effects include the obvious, you know, harmful effects on marine life, you know, choking of turtles, choking of fishes, corals, smothering of seagrasses. Um, uh, dolphin, uh, dead dolphins have been found and trapped in these mats. There is also, of course, physical barriers to artisanal fisheries, particularly those that depend on net fishing, because these would clog nets or would so the, the mats would entangle propellers of small boats and keep boats from going out. Plus, the drag would increase the cost of fuel you know, because they, the boats would spend more fuel trying to move. Um, erosion is an interesting one. Depending on how you actually try to clean the sargassum from the coastline, you may be actually increasing erosion or decreasing erosion because the sargassum, as it mixes with the sand, it tends to stabilize the sediment and it serves as basically fertilizing um, a fertilizing medium for dune plants. But because people tend to remove these using heavy machinery, then that effect of the heavy machinery is actually eating up some of the coastline. 
Um, the ones that people focus the most are the human dimensions of these events. And people often look at either fisheries or the effects on tourism. Um, so the other aspect that is uh, important in terms of economics is how much does it cost to manage the problem? So the beach cleanings do not come for free. And even though there's a fraction that is done by volunteers, for the most part, these cleanings are either done by the government of the islands affected or by private entities such as hotels. As you see it, this is a novel environmental problem, but we have been managing this problem or at least approaching it the same way that we approach, approach other harmful algal blooms. So all this stuff and how to, how to deal with it and what to do in case of an event belong to the category as we know this. And the reason why I, I accept that that's the way we've been operating is because this paper from 2015 in which I documented this, this die off, these white spots that you see here are dead fish. These are clupates, the group that belong the, to which uh, anchovies and sardines belong to. And this is in the in the northern uh, bay of St. Thomas, Comandao, where this massive die off was found. When we tried to publish this paper, it got rejected twice. And the reason for rejecting it is because we knew that this happened. Except we didn't know that these things were happening at that time. And it actually took me, uh, it took a letter to the editor asking the reviewers to provide one paper, just one, that showed or demonstrated a die-off related to a microalga in the history of science for them to go like, oh, maybe we didn't know as much as we thought. But that inertia of thinking that we know more than we actually do has dominated the way that we are approaching this environmental problem. There has been an increase in the productivity of papers in the topic of sargassum. And I had to go back, of course, the skeptic scientist in me had to go like, well, do we really know that much about this problem? So if you take these almost by now more than 400 papers, and you break them down into topics, you realize that about half of them, you know, about 45% of them are on the ecology and physiology of sargassum blooms, which is what you would like to see. You want, if you want to control it, you need to know what the algae does because it's the way that you manage an algal bloom. Um, I wanna point out that about a quarter of these are about how to use the biomass. So there has been sort of a cottage industry that has has grown since 2011 on uses for sargassum on anything from house anything from bricks to build houses to sneakers and shoes made out of sargassum and this is still going on so about a quarter of this is devoted into biotechnology but i was like okay maybe and maybe we know more than i think and it's just that the literature is hidden if you take this literature and break it down however what you notice is that three quarters, more than three quarters of it, is actually, oh, sorry, no, two thirds of it is dedicated to the animals that live in sargassum. There is a fauna associated with these. These open mats in the ocean are considered critical fish habitat for a number of commercial species. So those have received a lot of uh, attention. It's also a, 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 an area that young turtles spend a lot of their young years at. So those have received attention, but there's also a diversity of invertebrates that and vertebrates that have evolved to live exclusively on these floating mats. And we got fish that look like the seaweed, and we got shrimp that look like the seaweed, and we got slugs that live like this that look like the seaweed. So, from the natural history perspective, and from the evolutionary standpoint, those have received a lot of attention. Only about a third of all this work has focused on what you need to know in order to control these blooms, which is the ecology and physiology of the seaweed itself. In fact, we may know some of it, but we don't know as much as we think we know. And we know more about how to use sargassum than we know about the ecology of the alga itself or the algae. There's also a number of, you know, this is of course, an area of, in, of public interest 
And there are thoughts that have been perpetuated or sort of tendencies that have been perpetuated even through the news or in the literature that make us believe that we are starting from 2011 and we don't know anything more than this. And you see phrases like this. This is a quote from a paper that I'm not gonna tell you who the author is just to not throw him, hear him or her under the bus, but although pelagic sargassum was previously reported in a tropical North Atlantic, it had never been observed in such large quantities as occurred in 2011. So again, we know this. Now this abstract that I just am putting you here that talks about how to use sargassum. It basically goes like, maybe we should be using all this sargassum that is stranded on the coast of Colombia. It's from 1994. So it preceded this paper by almost a decade. And in fact, this paper makes allusion to other papers on the matter. So what could be blocking that knowledge from being common, commonly widespread among scientists that do this kind of work. Turns out that there's a lot of literature that apparently is in languages that we don't often access. The paper is in Spanish. And because it's published in a local journal in Colombia, getting access to this literature is not something that, that comes up when you do something like a Google search or a web of science search. So, I would like to propose that there is an in, a large repository of observations that we have ignored over the years before the sargassum hit the fan in 2011. There's also a lot of misinformation and errors in public perception that have led to some contentious positions that are sort of dragging down or at least channeling some of the work that is being done. For example, there have been people who have accused or, or linked these sargassum events to completely unrelated issues like the, the deep water horizon oil spill. Um, and there have those have, who have called for, uh, for compensation from BP because the news grab onto this and keep beating that story to death and perpetuating falsehoods about what is driving these actual events. So in Barbados, this was part, this, this uh, reached a fever pitch where people started trying to write letters to BP and to the United Nations to intercede, um, asking for remuneration because somebody mentioned that oil was found attached to floating algal mats in the Gulf of Mexico. And without any link in between, somebody filled the blanks and said, okay, this was caused by the BP oil spill. So it's a hot button issue in many areas. There have been some efforts in trying to put these historical records together and we have become better over the years. There are at, at least two systems um, that are aimed at forecasting where these events are gonna be. One is called seas and the other one is called SAWS. One is managed by the University of South Florida. The other one started at, uh, at the University of Texas at Galveston. And there are indices, for example, this one from Caricus, which is uh, managed by NOAA, that give you a floating algal index. So these can be used by managers trying to see how bad it's gonna be in the next season. And there is a report that is put out periodically by uh, the folks from South Florida that can be used to try to, uh, to be prepared about possible harmful algal blooms of this kind or golden types. But where there is a mismatch is in two areas particularly. There is a limited coverage in many of these Caribbean islands of where events actually happen. And second, having a lot of algae floating in the water offshore doesn't mean that you're gonna get a golden tide. The golden tide happens at the shore and that's the one that affects human livelihoods on the coastline. So it is difficult to manage something as such as this, which is a moving target when we don't have better predictive abilities for what's happening inshore. And among this, complicating this is that there are a lot of archive observations that are difficult to get to. 
And I will mention some of that in a little bit. So some of the knowledge gaps that I'm grappling with and trying to come up with a better uh, and more cohesive picture for includes our golden tide events matching what the models say that is going to happen in the future, particularly under climate change, change scenarios. Um, how do these increased sargassum mats in the ocean actually match to what's happening on the shoreline? And for that, we need to have better predictability of sort of small scale sea line, uh, seashore circulation. Um, and what are the impacts of golden tides on the environment and human communities? A lot of these are cannot be completely disentangled from one another. To illustrate some of the challenges, one of the problems with baselines and accumulating observations is that if you look at different sources, you will come up with different pictures. If you look at only the literature, the scientific literature, and you look at St. Thomas or the Virgin Islands for that matter, it looks like this has only happened once. That star is Mandel Bay. It illustrates the one paper that has been published on it, which is the one that I showed you. If you add observations from some of the newspapers, then you come up with more places that, are, that have reported these. And if you open this to networks of people, if you do this using social media and asking for observations, then the picture keeps growing and growing and growing. So one of the things that I believe is that citizen science is gonna play an important role in understanding and predicting where these events are gonna happen in the future. Now, there are efforts to do this. So this website, for example, is an open website where people can upload pictures if they are in a beach where one of these events happen. They can actually take a picture and upload it and make comments about when it happened, where it happened, upload the coordinates, the conditions, make any observations that they want. The problem is that in order to use these data, you need to pay a ton of money so it is not public access even though it is publicly uploaded. So this is one of the, of the barriers that we have. Nevertheless, by using different approaches and doing data mining, and this is work that I did with undergraduates in my coral reef ecology class, we've been able to piece together where some of these events happen. As you can see, there are not just a few. These are events that we were able, my students and I, my undergraduate students and I, were able to vet by looking at both historical records, but also vetting them by using pictures that more than two, more than three observers agreed represented sargassum accumulations. In other words, golden tides, because there is not a standard to say what a golden tide is. Some of these pictures that we encounter were just the normal amount of sargassum that always finds itself into the coastline but because they were taken by tourists that are not familiar with what the normal conditions are, they thought that these were abnormal events. So it takes a village, so to speak, and it takes more than just, uh, more than just a picture to vet whether a golden tide occurred. Nevertheless, using these uh, more than 10,000 observations now, um, we were able to piece together a number of things and answer a few important questions. For example, is there seasonality? Can we prepare for managing these things on the shoreline by focusing our attention on certain months? And it, it appears that it is, that it has at least a seasonal peak across the Caribbean. What is interesting though, is it doesn't seem to go away completely, which is a rather unexpected result. There are golden tides happening somewhere in the Caribbean at any time of the year. And we need to become better at explaining that. We also found that the frequency is increasing, which is what you would expect if this is a, a, an intensifying problem. We do not know what the drivers are. Climate change is probably gonna be in the mix, but also eutrophication of the Caribbean at large is another important factor here. There's also very uneven uh, sets of reports. Some countries appear to have many, many reports, whereas others have only few. And the question becomes whether this is a real pattern or just a function of where people go for vacation. 
because a lot of this is driven by people just going on vacation and having their vacation, quote unquote, ruined by the seaweed. So we need to sort of evaluate these observations with a little bit of a more objective lens here. As far as predicting where it's gonna land, we don't have a good way of doing that. I know that there's many groups that are trying to approach that very question, increasing the accuracy of circulation models. One of the things that I did with my undergraduates was to look at some of the embayment condition indices that were developed by the geologists. And this, these indices were developed to try to predict the type of beach that you would find in a bay. Now, it turns out that in the Caribbean, a lot of the beaches that get affected by this are actually embayments. And in many islands like the Virgin Islands, most of the coastline is comprised of small embayments, one next to the other, to the other, to the other. So if we can come up with some kind of applied index that takes the shape of the bay, which is what this does, and tells us something about their propensity to accumulate sargassum when it's there, maybe we have a very inexpensive tool, easy to use, something that is easy to calculate with uh, free, so basically your know, Google Maps, so free available data. And then by using this, maybe we can hone in our efforts better. And it turns out that if we do this, if we apply that index, which I, again, was not developed to predict sargassum, but to predict the shape of the beach, which is a function of internal circulation in the bay. If you do that, there is no effect of the length of the bay. So the depth of the, the length from the mouth to the beach, there is no effect of its orientation in relation to the equator, a non-significant trend, trend in terms of bay area, but not surprisingly, the ones that say yes are the ones that have reported at least three golden tides in our database. And this is a data set of about 77 different beaches. The wider the mouth, the more prone that it is to, uh, to accumulate sargassum. What was really interesting though, is that when we applied that index itself, we found a very strong significant pattern where we could discern bays that never had any reports of getting any golden tides versus those that had at least three of such events reported in the past. And it turns out that applying these uh, applying models, we get to about a 70% predictive ability in which that index, along with the width of the bay and other variables, allow us to be about 70% certain that a bay will get sargassum or not when the season comes. Now, 70% is not great, but it's not bad either. In terms of modeling, this is not a bad result. So we are hoping to develop this better and hone in with more data in order to make it a more useful tool for manager. Now, people talk about the negative effects of sargassum mostly in terms of tourism and fisheries, as I also said, as I already said. And many islands often point out that they've had to invest a lot of money into cleaning beaches because there would be people can canceling their vacations or coming in and making, basically they don't want a negative image. Um, the, the amounts of money range from $9 million in Mexico to $5 million here in Trinidad and Tobago, to many numbers that are just thrown out but have not been confirmed by us because they are held very tightly. This is in St. Thomas. And in St. Thomas, there's two groups that make these cleanups. One is the government, so public works. And the other group are actually the, the tourist industry itself, the hotel association, the hotel owners, are investing a lot of money in cleaning the beaches that, that are in front of their hotels. But if we are to understand what the actual bioeconomic effects of these events are, we need access to those numbers and we don't have them. So we need to go to publicly available data. And in order to illustrate how difficult this is, 
I'm going to give you a contrast of, of two islands, St. Thomas versus Barbados, in which there's publicly available data on things like uh, GDP, weight, money. So if tourism is affected by sargassum golden tides, you would expect then that years that have sargassum golden tides or years following those would see decreases in tourism. Barbados is among the islands that have been affected the most. If you look at total GDP, and these are from data from the Barbados Statistical Service and from the, uh, the United Nations. So if you look at total GDP, the lines, the red lines here indicate years that had intense golden tides. This is tourism weight GDP for Barbados. If you do numerical modeling on whether those years that had sargassum events see decreases in tourism, we find no effect at all. So now we have a mismatch between perceived damages or perceived environmental effects and provable environmental effects. Now, if you notice, these data only go to 2000, 2015. We don't know what the numbers look further down the line because in 2017, we had two catastrophic hurricanes that really strongly affected the Caribbean. And that throws a wrench in the type of modeling that we're doing. So we need to sort of reassess our models to account for that anomaly that, that came because of these two category five hurricanes. Nevertheless, we don't find strong evidence for tourism being depressed by golden tides. We don't know exactly why that is. If you look at arrivals in St. Thomas, St. Croix, and St. John, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, either by by cruises, which is the biggest one, or by air, we don't see any relation between the presence of golden tides or golden tide events and tourism numbers. The same happens if you look at hotel occupancy. But one difference between Barbados and the Virgin Islands is that we have data like this, like data like hotel occupancy and different types of arrival for the Virgin Islands, whereas we don't have similar data for comparison for many other islands in the Caribbean because either tourism impacts are collected differently or because there is not a management agency that is collecting these data at all. It becomes a difficult thing to track. What about fisheries? This is fisheries in terms of landings, total fisheries production in metric tons. And this is for Barbados. Again, the red lines indicate years of golden tides. And this is, these are the data for the Virgin Islands. Another way of showing how difficult it is to look at these types of effects is that patterns of fisheries are codependent on a number of other extraneous variables like the type of fisheries that you have, whether it's commercially organized or not, whether there are associations, whether it's mostly artisanal, what type of boats you have, how many people do these efforts. Nevertheless, this is where it gets really interesting because if we model the Barbados data, we find that in years that where there, there were golden tides recorded, there is an almost 18% decrease in total landings than in years that there were not. So this is work that I've been doing in collaboration with uh, Tuan Le and uh, my colleague Tom Lombardi, uh, who were at, um, at West Virginia, uh, uh, West Virginia and uh, the University of the Virgin Islands before, and now are collaborating with me from other places. Um, we're also interested in looking at other environmental effects that may have um, implications for human health. And one that is getting a lot of attention recently is the role of microplastics in um, both environmental, uh, in both natural populations and in human populations. Uh, one of my graduate students, Olivia Diana, has been looking at whether these algae are actually rafting microplastics from offshore and delivering to beaches and whether they're operating as vectors of microplastic pollution. Now, these data that I'm showing you here are not related to sargassum, 
But when we started doing this, we found that there were very good methods for quantifying microplastics in sediment and water, but not in seaweed. So we had to evaluate our own uh, and develop our own techniques. So these are data that were done. These are microplastic fibers, fragments, and total microplastics for three seaweeds. And these experiments were done in, um, in a natural preserve at Bodega Bay using algae that occur there where you would expect different, you know, we would expect low levels of microplastics. And we use these as a way of developing techniques to be able to do this with the sargassum that occurs in the Caribbean, both the floating species and as a comparison, the ones that live in the bottom. Now, what I want you to look at is that the darker bars represent the microplastic counts that we found using the methods by NOAA, which are the standardized methods that everybody uses. These lighter bars are the methods that we develop to look at microplastics in seaweed using a slightly different technique. And what we find is that our numbers are orders of magnitude higher than what has been reported using the NOAA methods. So we are looking at why that is, and we're in the process of publishing this. Nevertheless, what we're trying to do is apply this new method to quantifying and comparing whether these sargassum mats are rafting microplastics to the shore or not. And we're comparing that with the native species that live attached at the bottom. So managing golden tides, of course, is of public interest, but it's not as easy as it sounds. For one, there are no existing baselines for many islands or the data are difficult to get to if you, we, we want a hindcast and use that hindcast in order to predict what the future holds. There are no general management plans and no cost analysis for many places. We have greatly improved on these. Management, sargassum management plans are sprouting, are sprouting all over the Caribbean though. So we are improving in leaps and bounds on this one. Um, and the one that we have to fight the most is public perception and versus actual information because there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of misconceptions and one of the greatest misconceptions is that all sargassum is bad sargassum it's uh for those of you who are in the medical sciences it's the equivalent of cholesterol where at one point the word cholesterol meant only bad so sargassum right now is at the stage of meaning only bad but we don't understand what what its role is on ecosystem function at large for example, as I mentioned, there are animals that live all their life cycle in sargassum or part of their life cycle in sargassum. Two of these are these two shrimp. This is also work that I did with undergraduates. And it turns out that these ones are always found in the floating sargassum, but these guys have a shift in their life cycle where they live in the floating sargassum and then they jump ship and start living in the bottom of the ocean in the coastline. So we did experiments where they we gave them a choice between the floating sargassum and the one that lives at the bottom. And we looked at where they were sitting after six and, 10, uh, and, and 24 hours. And what we found is that the one that has that sort of life cycle shift started using the, the local benthic sargassum more after 24 hours, whereas the other one was found all over the place. Why is this important? Well, because as much as we don't like to see the sargassum rafts, they may be important methods of delivery for completing the life cycle of species, which may have important roles in the ecosystem that we don't understand very well. So these may have implications for metapopulation dynamics, for genetic diversity of these animals, in the shoreline. And if we start considering that all sargassum is bad sargassum and trying to get rid of it and divert it, we may be affecting other species that we don't understand as well. There's also the fact that there is an entire community that takes care of breaking down things on the shoreline. And that community includes a lot of different invertebrates that whose job is to be basically the janitors of the coast. And they live off this imported organic matter that lands on the beaches. They include 
many invertebrates from flying invertebrates like fruit fly, uh, different types of fruit flies, spring tails, uh, roly polies, amphipods, and isopods. They call them often uh, sand fleas. And what we did to understand these is we took these pitfall traps where animals just basically fall, as exactly as it sounds, and we baited them with algae that live on the coastline or with algae that is coming in in these sargassum wraps. And for some groups like the asopods, you know, they there were no differences. There's the one, the floating sargassum is here. This is another brown alga that lives on the coastline. And this is the local sargassum that grows on the rocks. No difference for isopods, no difference for ants, no difference for amphipods, except there was a slight increase between the local sargassum compared to one of the algae. But where it gets really interesting is if you look at the flies, we caught significantly more flies than in the controls for the floating sargassum. It was not different from that sargassum that lives in the coastline. And this is a very low replication because it was preliminary work. But what this suggests is that different organisms may be complementing their efforts or maybe focusing or targeting different resources. And these floating sargassum rafts may be actually feeding the biodiversity or helping maintain coastal biodiversity of these invertebrates, which in turn become food for larger things like shorebirds and small and larger invertebrates. These subsidies, which is a term that we use for this organic matter that accumulates from the shore, are poorly understood. And we have a good system in which we're to understand what that means for things like nutrient cycling on the coastline. Because as I mentioned, if you look at the coastline of the Virgin Islands, it's mostly small embayments, one next to the other. In the southern part, there is Brewer's Bay. And this is where the University of the Virgin Islands is. So Brewer's Bay is an area that is very touristy. It has a nice sandy beach there that a lot of people go. And it's also blocked by the airport runway. So as you fly into St. Thomas, you're seeing the University of the Virgin Islands next to you. So next to it is Perseverance Bay. And in previous observations, what I, what I observed is that the sargassum comes in, bypasses Brewer's Bay, goes straight to Perseverance because it, Brewer's Bay is protected and it doesn't get, as much, doesn't get as much sargassum. So I was like, okay, this is a great opportunity to look at nutrient cycle cycling on the shore. So what I'm expecting is that Perseverance is going to have a lot of carbon, organic carbon mixed in with the sand, and then Brewer's Bay, what I'm calling Brewer's Bay West, will have a little bit more, but still less than Perseverance, and then this would have, this Brewer's Bay East would have the least. So I did this, did this using a loss of an ignition type of approach. You basically ash your samples, and calculate the difference, and that gives you how much organic carbon. Long story short, it sounded great, but it didn't work. So Perseverance was higher than Brewers West, but it wasn't higher than Brewers East. So this is a little bit more complex and dynamic than I thought. However, it is important in terms of things like biogeochemical cycling and understanding nutrient conversions in the shoreline and the fate of these organic subsidies. So right now I am recruiting a PhD student who will be tackling these interactions between uh, floating mats and nutrient cycling on the sediments. So to summarize some of this, we have a decade of observations here and we have made great theoretical advances and experimental work to a lesser extent um, on how these, on what the effects of these golden tides are. But we still have many fundamental questions that remain poorly answered, not completely unanswered, but poorly answered. We don't know enough about the natural history of these shorelines. And that's something that people are noticing all across the world. It's not just um, in the Caribbean. We don't know enough about small circulation 
uh, small scale circulation patterns, which may be the dominant forces determining whether these mats occur in the coastline or not. This is again, improving and there's multiple groups, including colleagues that I'm working with to try to enhance our predicted capabilities by developing these meso and sub meso scale circulation models to try to predict better where the sargassum is gonna end. We know very, very little about how biodiversity is affected by these uh, golden tides. We know a little bit about how it affects the aquatic side of things, but know how that, not how that connects to the terrestrial fauna and flora. We need better integration between forecasting and reporting sargassum because a lot of what has been historically done has been through remote sensing and those satellite observations are good to about one kilometer offshore or a few kilometers offshore. So we know a lot about what's going up going on in open waters, but not as much as what is going on in the shoreline. And this is where I think that citizen science will be priceless. We also need, just like we get uh, observations from citizen scientists, we also need to do a better job educating the public and keeping some uh, basically misleading notions from spreading out. And that includes stressing that there are both positive and negative effects to these events. And everything happens, everything in excess may, uh, of course, things in excess tend to be bad, but there is a component of this sargassum that is part of the natural cycle of things and has been happening for thousands to maybe millions of years. Which takes me to why am I talking to you today? Why is it that an ecologist, basically a, a plant herbivore interactions ecologist is talking to you on an RCMI uh, seminar series. And the reason for that is, as Valerie mentioned, I recently was able to secure a supplement to look at the effects of these events on human populations, especially interested in the decomposition stage of these sargassum accumulations. On the one of the very first slides that you that you saw mentioned the sulfur, the smell of rotten eggs. It turns out that we know very little about how this affects coastal communities, but there is evidence for some islands that this increases the number of, of people reporting to clinics with respiratory illnesses, and there are a number of effects that have been reported, especially in cleanup crews, that appear to be the symptoms that you would expect with people exposed to sulfides. But there are other gases that form in the decomposition process, some that are important because they're greenhouse gases such as methane. So we are, I am in the process of starting a monitoring, uh, a, some experimental manipulations and some monitoring of beaches in the Virgin Islands, trying to see what the fluxes of gases are based on the amount of biomass and the condition of this sargassum biomass in which is decomposing. There's other work that is that started uh, this early last year, um, well, early last summer, I should say, looking at how the composition affects nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes in these bays and how it affects water quality and sea life. And this is work that is funded by NASA right now, is the, the grant that is gonna be accepting two PhD students through Morgan State to work on these issues starting this coming summer and from then on for a couple more years. And of course, one of those positions is also going to be looking at these interactions, but not between the seaweed, decomposing seaweed and the water, but decomposing seaweed and the sediments, along with a, a position that is funded through UBI, looking at the effects of these accumulations on coastal biodiversity. So the future looks bright in terms of studies. It looks grim in terms of sargassum, but hopefully we're gonna be able to use this information to develop better strategies to manage, if not control these events. There are a lot of people that contributed to some of the data. A lot of it, the vast majority of what I showed you was done with, uh, the, uh, with the help of undergraduates that took classes or work on independent projects with me. 
particularly at UVI, have been less successful trying to recruit student, students in the uh, biology department here at Morgan State. But if you know of any, send them my way. They may get a trip to the Caribbean. Um, my graduate students, Jim and Caitlin, are right now being funded through my NASA grant and their station at UVI, their counterparts at Morgan State will be hired this year. And then my colleagues, Tuan Le, Tom Lombardi and Paul Jobsis, who have been working with me on different aspects of what you saw today. And some volunteers that have become part of honorary members of the Cruz Rivera Lab. Uh, begrudgingly, my wife, myself, Flores Diaz, because everywhere I go, I drag her with me and try to convince her that this is interesting stuff. Um, and my buddy Ken Banks, who is a, a, a Virgin Islander uh, by choice, not by design, and who's my guide on all these very difficult to navigate uh, bays that on, I don't even know the names of sometimes. Um, of course, this is a composite talk and I got funding, uh, I gratefully acknowledge the funding from NSF in the past and right now from NSF EBSCOR and from NASA, as well as a starting grant supplement from the National, in National Institutes of Health. And with that in mind, I open the floor to any questions. Uh, okay. How are these moderated? Are, Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has a question, just put your hand up with the, whatever you call those things, the reaction thing, put your hand up if you have a question. And yeah, the, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. I was wondering what, while others are putting their hands up, is there a difference between different oceans like Pacific versus Atlantic or Indian Ocean? Like can temperature play a part in the golden tides? Do you think? So, so that is a really interesting question. This, the, the Yellow Sea in China is getting events like these and they're using the term golden tides but the species is different. It's an invasive species that grows on the bottom, but the life cycle is such that the plants seasonally detach and disperse their spores that way. So there is a paper that has sort of summarized all these algal events, all these brown algal events uh, related to sargassum, and they seem to be driven by more than one species in different places. The Indian Ocean, I don't know of any reports there. But definitely in, in the China Sea, this is becoming a problem. There's also concern of what they call green tides. If mm -hmm. you saw the Olympics um, of a while back, um, the the regatta, the, the sailing competitions had to be canceled until they clean all the green algae from the bay that this was going to happen. This was in, um, was it Korea or, I don't remember who hosted them a few years back, but it made the news. So green tides are kind of the same phenomenon, but it's, it's not floating brown algae, it's actually filamentous green algae that grows out of control and causes these sort of similar effects. In France, there's at least one recorded death of a person that was suffocated by the sulfites of one of these green tides decomposing, and a lot of die-offs from uh, domestic animals also. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. There was one in the... Uh, so you can go ahead and answer the one in the chat. In the chat, something about the, the corals. I'm interested in the distribution of corals and its effects on golden tides. Um, so one of the things that we know is, well, one of the things that has been suggested by one paper is that these nutrients that come from the decomposition of the golden tides may be traveling downstream and causing all kinds of problems in the coral reefs, particularly the ones in the Caribbean, which are now being hit by a lot of different diseases. So eutrophication is always a problem for coral reefs. Moving forward, do you have any plans to share your data for the other research uses? Yes, I'm hoping that that all of what I'm accumulating will become so part of the agreement is to to provide this to managers and try to devise better strategies for handling these issues when they happen. Okay. Okay, well, um 
Thank you very much. Unless one more question, otherwise, thank you very much. If I don't see any other hand up. Yeah, I cannot see Shiva. everybody. So if you have a question, Sh please Shiva, speak up. Shiva, did you want to ask something since you turned no, on? No, I just wanted to say thank you because okay. I saw these on the beaches when I maybe 10, 15 years ago when I was in Porto. Uh -huh. And I saw the leaves and they, they had these little bunchy heads on them and they were everywhere. And I was wondering what they were back in the days. I wasn't really in the habit of Googling or lensing. So I could see it. And I was like, what is this stuff? <laughs> So, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Now, every video that you see in the Caribbean for any purpose of uh, tourism will have a bunch of sarcasm in the background now, <laughs> which didn't yeah. used to be like that. So, Scott. Yeah. Hey, Edwin. Hey. Great, great presentation, sir. Really enjoy it. It's very expansive. Of course, I have some interest in the economics. I appreciate you digging into that a bit. It's at a real rough level though, right? You're looking at like year by year and like if there is an event in a year, how might that have affected tourism? And yeah. of course events can vary in magnitude. And I think like in your time series too, is like there was events like in seven out of the most recent nine years. So there's like, it's more or less perfectly confounded with whatever else is happening that's unobservable during that time frame. So. Is there a possibility of getting some finer resolution data on, you know, uh, hotel vacancies or spending or whatever, rather than just the year by year? But if you had week by week, you could um, you could really look into what's happening when there's a sargassum event and what happens that week, what happens the following week. Presumably, you know, there's a lag, there's like some lag effect where people maybe hear about it in the news, and then there's diminished travel for some period of time. I mean, the possibilities are really there's a lot of them so yeah no. what's what's your thoughts on that trying to get you in on board on this one i think we, we gotta start <laughs> bumping papers i mean you you want me to stay in maryland i'm good with developing projects for, for maryland but i don't think that you're gonna be opposed to going to the caribbean okay i know um, you're gonna get me in trouble by asking that okay yeah so, so your so answer we, is like i need to work on it with you <laughs> yeah no no so the resolution is very variable i mean we can yeah. get we can get uh, month to month for some islands. Week to week, I haven't seen any data set like that. Uh -huh. um, but not all of these islands have a, a department of tourism. You know, yeah, we we are usually some... the ones that keep track of these numbers. Yeah, we could talk offline about doing some beach surveys like they do. This is analogous to an oil spill. It's an episodic event. It happens. It's highly unpredictable. The way they, they explore the lost use, the, lot, the economic impacts in deep water horizon be very similar to what happens with the sargassum events. Yeah, I, I I've, been trying, I've been trying to get the numbers, for example, for example, how much money the hotel association or different hotels are spending in these cleanups. And mm -hmm. everybody holds those numbers very close to heart. Yeah, I asked from sure. the BI government how much public works was actually spending. They promised me the numbers. They never gave them to me. So it's very difficult to model things mm -hmm. when all you have is question marks. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. Okay. Well, Thanks, thank, you so, yeah, yeah. thank you so much. We've come to the end of the talks today. And it was refreshing to see something different. So thank you. Even for us uh, basic scientists, we really enjoyed it. Okay. And uh, so um, bid everyone farewell for today. Until next week. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Thank Bye. you.